everybody. Jesse Shell here. Very glad to be here today. Um, I've been doing VR for years. First time I've given a talk in VR, so that's pretty exciting. So what I was going to talk about today, I was going to talk about educational VR games. I've been working in VR a long time. I started back in 1992 at Carnegie Mellon. After that, I was working at the Disney Virtual Reality Studio in the 90s. And uh, then I started teaching at Carnegie Mellon, teaching a building virtual worlds class. And I also run a video game studio called Shell Games, where we've done an awful lot of uh, virtual reality games. Some of our best known ones are entertainment games like I Expect You to Die and Until You Fall. Um, but today I'm going to talk more about uh, educational um, VR games that we've had experience with. We've produced uh, several different ones uh, to this point. I guess four different main ones I'm going to talk about today. And uh, there's an awful lot to say about educational VR games. We've been learning a lot of lessons as we've been doing this. So a lot of people ask questions, you know, really, is VR really ready for education? Because aren't there meaningful problems like motion sickness can be a real problem? Um, so far, I would say motion sickness with well-designed uh, experiences is, uh, is something that you don't have to worry about, but they have to be well-designed experiences. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait, isn't it too expensive? Um, because obviously, you know, VR is kind of high tech and, and potentially very expensive. But of course, as many of you know, I'm sure many of you are checking it out right now, uh, probably wearing it at this moment. Um, the Oculus Quest system has really made a major breakthrough in terms of platform. Now we have a system that is under $400, requires no wires, requires no PC, requires no uh, phones. And that, I think, is going to be the huge breakthrough for the educational market. Already, we're seeing just the accessibility of that. Is, it's really exploding in terms of mass market popularity. And I think we're going to see that next move into uh, the realm of education. But then you still have the question of hygiene, which has always been an issue, but is now kind of in the age of the pandemic is more of an issue than ever. If you're talking about people sharing headsets in a school environment, that's a real thing that you have to contend with. But even that there are solutions for. There are things like the clean box, which is a relatively uh, inexpensive system that uh, uses ultraviolet light to uh, destroy vi viruses and bacteria inside uh, your headsets. We use these at the studio uh, when we have headsets that are shared and when we go to conferences or, uh, or trade shows where we have to uh, use a VR headset in a, in a public place. Now, of course, obviously the pandemic makes this a little different, but when things get back to normal, hygiene is getting manageable um, for shared headsets. But then you got the question of, are schools themselves actually ready? Because some of the things we know about schools is they tend to be very slow to adopt new technology. That's just how it is with schools. Um, it, it's part of how they operate. And they, they're slow for good reasons, right? They, they can't be adopting every new thing that comes along because they need things that work. Um, but because schools are slow to adopt techno new technologies, I mean, think about when was television invented, right? The 1940s. When did television come into schools? Maybe around the 1980s. So it took about 40 years for television to, to kind of make that uh, breakthrough. Think about when the Internet first showed up and then think about when it started making a difference in schools. A lot of people would argue that even now we're still the television still catch. I mean, <laughs> education is still catching up with where the internet was in the 90s. And so I don't think we should expect virtual reality to go, go streaming into the schools, but it is something that is starting to happen. So in terms of making educational VR experiences, I'm gonna give a few tips today. And the first one is you wanna focus on the body. A lot of people think of virtual reality as an experience for the mind, an experience for the eyes, but really, virtual reality is an experience that's all about the body. It lets you bring your body into a computer simulation. And so that means that when you are thinking about experiences that are going to make sense for it, you want to think about things that involve the body. And this is all about the sense of presence. People who do VR all the time, they're familiar with this idea. But I think a lot of people forget, even if, if you're familiar with it, even if, you, if you've experienced it, it doesn't always mean that you really get how important it is. The idea of presence is that feeling of actually being in a space and in a place. 
right? Um, because that's the magic that VR brings. It lets you feel like you're actually in a place that you are not. And, and there's real power in that. That can be a very strong experience. We very often see people in VR um, accidentally lean against imaginary objects. And they, of course, they know intellectually those objects aren't real, but something inside their body believes the illusion so much that they're actually willing to treat them as if they're physical objects. This doesn't happen with television or other flat media. <clears throat> and part of that is using your hands. A big part of the way presence happens is your ability to reach into the world and grab things with your hands. Um, and so making experiences where using your hands actually matters is important. So we created something called HoloLab Champions. This is a, uh, a chemistry lab experience. And we, because we were thinking about what, what kind of experiences could, like, would not be possible without VR. And we started thinking about education. We started thinking about chemistry labs, because what you do in chemistry labs is so oriented uh, towards just being physical, learning how to properly manipulate glassware, learning, you know, that the fact that when you look at a graduated cylinder and you're trying to measure it, you actually have to bend down so that you can see where it is. Your body is very involved. And so, uh, we thought that this would be a, a good way to, to bring your body into the lab. And so I'll show you a little trailer of it uh, right here. Welcome to the greatest event in the galaxy. The traditional chemistry lab finally has a modern companion. Developed with input from chemistry teachers, HoloLab Champions is an immersive, safe, and entertaining environment that makes mastering lab skills fun. As game show contestants, players can perform a variety of lab challenges, leading to a show-stopping final lab. Or, in practice mode, they can hone their skills on specific tasks. Players are scored on accuracy and safety as they perform work that prepares them for success in a real lab. Hall Lab Champions is the chemistry lab companion you've been waiting for. All right. Uh, so, yeah, you can see uh, how that worked, that um, that was something that the both students and teachers found really engaging and really exciting to be able to actually be in the chemistry lab uh, and learn those real skills. So hands are important and having your and that's that's part of what you want to focus on experiences that use your hands, but also experiences where place really matters. Uh, that there's a team that made a, a, an exciting experience that's all about being inside the Anne Frank house. Now, my whole life, I've heard stories from people who've actually visited the real life Anne Frank house, and they often come away talking about how influential it was and how the feeling of being in there and being in that place really made them understand the situation in a way they never had before. And the same thing is true in the VR experience. The the VR experience is is very um, it really affects people because there's something about being in that place and in that situation that gives an understanding that reading about it, watching a video, it's just not going to make you understand. So this is a thing to think about. What are places that are going to transform people in a meaningful way? Because VR is good at putting you in places. Another thing to think about is being near another person. We have a lot going on in our heads. It's all about dealing with the feeling of being near another person. We have a we have a special um, nucleus in our in our brains that is all about that feeling of when something comes uh, closer than arms reach to you, right? If if you're if you're sitting next to another person and like someone puts their hand like into your personal space, you can feel that part of your brain wake up. There's something very real about being near um, other people. And one great experience was created by some Carnegie Mellon students, an experience called Injustice that was all about uh, confronting uh, situations of police brutality. And by actually putting you in the situations where you have to deal and decide what are you going to say, what are you going to do? And it's one thing to read about it, one thing to hear about it, another thing to be there and have to make decisions on the fly. It's, a, it's very memorable and does a great job at promoting conversations. And then, of course, the idea of being another person, 
going into somebody else's shoes. Another experience created by Carnegie Mellon students was an experience called Thin Line. And this was designed to help doctors and nurses understand what it's like to be a woman who has had an abortion and then has to go and talk to doctors and nurses about it. Because very often there is prejudice against patients who have had an abortion um, by doctors and nurses. And this experience of kind of hearing the story of this person and kind of going through their life and then seeing what is it like to be a patient going to see doctors and nurses that that uh, look down on you because of your, your past is something that really helps open the minds of doctors and nurses. And so thinking about situations where you being somebody else actually matters and can help open someone's mind is is something worth thinking about. Um, so related to that is the idea of making VR into something that will let people be creative. It can be tempting to just use VR as a playback device, um, just like you are right now. You're watching me you kind of give a lecture and it's a playback device. But when VR is something that can be a creative tool, of course, right now I'm using it as a creative tool, um, then people can get much more engaged. I wonder who's more engaged right now, you or me? We'll have to think about that. Obvious examples are things like Tilt Brush, where people get to do 3D sculpting right there uh, in VR, and, and, you, and you, the things you draw and sculpt are all around you. Those are very incredibly engaging. We worked on one called History Maker. We asked ourselves the question of what is going to be the best way to use VR to, to uh, create an experience that connects students to history? And at first, everybody thinks about, oh, we'll create battlefields, we'll create ancient cities. And of course, those things are incredibly uh, expensive to do. And, you know, you're going to spend millions of dollars to build this. And we, we kept looking, how could we do something much more economical that could, could also be influential? So we started thinking about uh, VR as a creative tool. And so I'll show you a little tr our little trailer of how History Maker VR works. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Welcome to today's social studies classroom, where the virtual reality content creation tool, History Maker VR, can enhance the learning experience. Students can immerse themselves in history while showing off their knowledge by embodying eight diverse characters across U.S. history, from Ben Franklin to Sonia Sotomayor. It's easy to use. Students set up the scene and select their props, create their performance, import their script, and start recording. Export, edit, and share their performances with teachers and classmates. So you get the idea there. It's uh, not that different from what I'm doing right here, except that it's focused much more on stepping into the shoes of uh, historical figures and actually being able to give speeches uh, as that figure. And it is very powerful to be able to step into the, the shoes of these characters uh, and these, these historical figures and look down and your body is their body and you have their skin and you look in the mirror and there's their reflection right there. Um, we found that uh, not only do the students find it very engaging because creating interesting videos is so culturally relevant for them, but we found history teachers found this very interesting and inspiring because perspective taking is something that they care so much about. So my third tip is finding ways to design for both teachers and students together. Um, Certainly, these are things we focused on with both Hololab and History Maker. We kind of thought about what do the teachers care about, what do the students care about. In Hololab, the students were most interested in kind of finding ways to fool around. And that sounds bad, but it's really not because when they're fooling around, they're learning the boundaries of what's acceptable and what's not. It's always a problem. Students want to fool around in real world chemistry labs to be able to get that fooling around out of your system and actually kind of break some glass. And it's OK in in the virtual world kind of makes everybody understand where the boundaries are. Now, what the teachers really cared about, the teachers cared about 
um, students learning proper lab practice. We at first were very focused on chemical reactions because we thought, oh, that surely is going to be what the teachers are going to want to teach. But it turns out they really cared much more about what's the right way to use a balance? What's the right way to scoop powder? What's the right way to use um, a pipette? Those sorts of things. And so we ended up turning it into a game show all about are, can you do chemistry uh, practices properly? Um, so another tip is fulfilling educational fantasy because people always focus on, oh, what's the curriculum and oh, what's the fun. But thinking about the educational fantasy is an important idea. And one place we did this was an experience we created called Deep Time Detectives that we created for the Smithsonian Institution. This was something that was designed for parents and children to play together. The concept is that a family goes to the museum. Only one of them can put on the headset. It's usually one of the children. And that the, the person in the headset has the ability to kind of uncover fossils and the the rest of the family is looking at a screen of what they're doing, but they have another screen that has more information about the fossils. And it forces the family to have discussions together um, because only some of them have the different types of information and they have to talk about identifying these fossils. Now, this experience, we could have kept it very um, just like, here's your fossils, now let's talk about them. But we realized it was very important to focus on the fantasy of what is it like to be a paleontologist. Um, so here you can take a look at a video of, uh, of a, a parent and child uh, doing this together. So my partner's uncovering a mystery fossil. What kind of animal could it be? So we didn't need uh, necessarily to do the actual brush. We didn't really need to put that in there, but we put it in because it's fun. First of all, like that's just a great VR interaction, kind of using the brush to kind of uncover the fossil. It's just fun to do. But secondly, it's a big part of the fantasy of being a paleontologist. And you hear them talk about it um, in the video. They, they talk all about how, uh, hey, you know what? This is even better than uh, at the actual museum. Oh, okay, all right. Um, so, tip number five is you wanna involve the spectators, right? So, uh, and that you saw part of that happening right there in Deep Time Detectives, is that when you have people who are watching, if you can find ways to kind of get them involved, um, that, that can um, help keep everybody interested. A great example of this is the game Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, a really successful VR game. If you haven't played this, you really should check it out. It's a lot of fun. So the way this works is uh, if you see on the left here, there's a group of people playing it. They have all these papers they printed out that are manuals about defusing a bomb. And you see, there's only one person there that actually has the headset on, and that person is the only one with access to the bomb. And this creates a really fun dynamic um, because it lets the people outside do something that's hard to do in VR. One thing's not great in VR, text. Text is not, detailed text is kind of hard to read, hard to manipulate, but here these, these people outside can have a lot of access to detailed text, and the person in VR, of course, can manipulate invisible 3D objects, and so that creates an awful lot of fun. So we used a lot of that same idea in Deep Time Detectives and tried to create experiences that required both players uh, to work together. So I talked about it a little bit, but here I want you to see what it's like uh, when two people work on this together. Closely related animals have bones with similar features. I told you to. Only, oh, okay. We'll tell you where to search. I mean, where to search that. Um, back, hind leg. Oh. Your fossil. I don't even know what that means. Department looking at an ankle bone diagram from the two animal groups. Describe your fossil and make sure to look at the red arrows. Discuss which of the two groups matches your fossil. You got seal dog group, whale deer group. I'm gonna do, do whale deer group because that that looks like a deer. Okay. Like you see like the head features and the ears. <laughs> So 
so you, you get the sense, you know, the, um, the, the father and son kind of working on this together. One of them can manipulate. The other one has access to other information. And they have to do the discovery uh, together. And that, you know, it, it, there, there's something really fun about designing uh, for that, letting letting people kind of participate together. Because not everybody's ready for VR. A lot of people just, they're like, oh, I'm not really ready for that. But they don't mind watching their friend do it. In fact, it's kind of fun for them to watch their friend do it. And if you create an experience where they can kind of work together, that can be a lot of fun. We found with our uh, successful title, I Expect You to Die, that's often how a lot of people play it. One person will wear the headset, another person's watching the screen and kind of offering advice about how to solve the puzzles. And it's a nice way to create something um, that's a social experience without having to deal with all the headaches of multiplayer, multi-headset um, gameplay. So now you may be still wondering like, okay, well, those are some interesting experiences, but I don't know if I'm ready to kind of embrace VR uh, for education. I mean, the market is too small. It's too early. There's a lot of reasons that you might say, hey, I'm not ready for that. But if you care about educational apps, I want you to look back in time a little bit. When people talk about some of the most successful educational games of all time, Oregon Trail always comes up. Um, it has been a, a game that has been a success in uh, getting people interested in history and, through gaming. This game came out in 1971. Can you imagine working on this in 1971? It just, you know, what market was there? It didn't make any sense to be doing this. And that's what pioneering is all about, right? If you are there early working on things, uh, if you're the first one in there, you have a chance at really influencing the way the entire medium is going to be used for the next 50 years. So something to think about that, yep, the market's not giant yet, but on the other hand, you might have a chance to be incredibly influential if you start working now. Thank you very much for having me here today. This was super fun to be here in VR and doing this. I'm happy to chat with anybody about these things. Do feel free to drop me an email um, if you like, and have a great time at the conference. <laughs>